Um, I guess my first question is, why are watches so popular? <laughs> um, but no, I guess um, maybe if we could just kind of take a step back a little bit um, and maybe just lay out what the fundraising climate is like in New Hampshire, because I wonder if the reason for this being so much optimism about crowdfunding is just because it is sort of dire. Um, I saw this report yesterday uh, in the stadium fact, I don't know if anyone reads that, it's NHPR's like, business blog, and it's really well done. Um, but it said there were only 11 VC investments in New Hampshire last year, compared to 400 in Massachusetts, um, and only 10% of which went to early stage companies. So I think that works out to about 1.1. <laughs> Um, so, do you think there is a lot of optimism with crowdfunding just because um, the climate is so difficult right now? Um, I, I would say that there's got to be at least a reason why, why people are, are looking at it. They're looking for alternatives because to raise money through equity over the last couple of years has been tough. Um, I will say, though, that I think it is loosening up a little bit. This is all anecdotal from just what, what we see in our practice. Um, Jason Ostrom, my colleague, is in the back there, too. and. You know, we spend time working with companies that are looking to raise money, um, trying to get them set up to do it the right way, ask the right questions, and be set up so that when they do like, have the opportunity to get in front of investors, they make the right impression. Um, there are things, though, that are happening in New Hampshire to what I would say cultivate the entrepreneurial ecosystem here. It's things like this. I mean, just getting people together in a room. And things will come out of this, hopefully, that will benefit everybody here in one way or another, whether it's raising money or something that maybe indirectly helps them raise capital. There's also um, another initiative, just to make everybody aware of, uh, that's happening that will give you some sense of the, the maybe the equity market here. Uh, a group of investors has gotten together, and they're going to pool together $100,000. And they're going to do a business plan competition called Tech Out. And they're going to award a $50,000 equity win, a $30,000 equity win, and a $20,000 equity win uh, for three companies in New Hampshire. Um, uh, application deadlines like mid-August and there's going to be a big event in September at some point. So there are initiatives like that that are starting. Um, I get the sense that the purse strings um, are loosened up a little bit. I think if you read the paper you will see that hopefully in 2012 there is more activity and we've been involved with some capital raising for our clients, some more successful than others. But just the fact it's happening is a good sign and hopefully it keeps up. But you know what? It doesn't all have to be equity raises either. I mean, there are, I think one of the things hopefully you get out of the discussion is the kind of money you raise and where you raise it has to be a good fit with whatever it is you're doing. And if you're looking to do a project, you're looking to do an indie film, don't go talk to the equity people. They don't care about that stuff. Go talk to Kickstarter. Figure out, based on what you want to do, where the right capital source is. And I think that's the way to do it, rather than trying to shoehorn your project into the wrong, wrong funding source. Um, I have a question that I think that you and Mike might kind of disagree on. Um, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, do you think it would be harder to attract um, VC funding if you've already had a bunch of sort of unsavvy mm -hmm. investors and you've already done a crowdfunding round? Mike, can you hear that? I did not just to know. Um, so Mike, the question was, do you think it's going to be harder for a company to attract um, bigger investors and more sophisticated investors, essentially they've already had a crowdfunding round with less sophisticated investors seeding the company? The, the important piece there is going to be the terms under which the crowdfunders invest in. If, if you give everyone of the crowdfunders, you know, voting rights and, and, and ability to block a deal later on down the road, a VC is never going to look at your company. Um, but if you're working with an attorney or a, or a portal that's kind of figured out all the concerns that uh, that a, that a VC is going to have um, and make sure that you kind of remove those issues from the investor right proactively when you take that first round of financing on, then there's not going to be going to be a big issue. Bijan from Spark Capital wrote about this uh, a few months back when there was you know more more uh, more impressed about crowdfunding. He's like, look, if you're a good company with traction and success, you know we're going to find a way to invest in you. So obviously there are going to be like variables on the margin for companies who are kind of you know interesting but not necessarily an obvious investment target um, and that's where you just want to make sure that you've done your homework to make sure you're protected when you take that first round of funding so i would just say it's a definite maybe uh maybe a problem i would say that i, I think that probably the message is I, i've had clients who have just screwed things up they don't have a lot of unsophisticated investors but they've screwed things up no matter what you're screwing up that's going to be a problem so I think if you can do crowdfunding the right way, there might be 
some investors that actually take a look at it and want to make sure it was done right. But if it's done right and they feel comfortable with how things are set up, um, then I, I, I don't think it'll be a big hurdle. But I think time will tell. Again, it's so new, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, so, question. Oh, yeah. I have a question for you, like putting me on the spot, right? Uh, I, I have my, my own personal philosophy. I can't speak for Jim. I know Jim pretty well, obviously, right? Um, but I, I think that, um, I mean, we try to do what we can as lawyers, I think, as a group. I can talk more, most specifically, I guess, about what I, what I do. But if I was to get a, a call from a client who had gotten to a certain point and wanted to kick around ideas, I'd say, you know what? Let, let's just go grab lunch, right? Just kind of an off the clock. Let's just sit down and talk through, hash through some ideas. That, with my thought being that I understand it's part of my pro bono practice. You know, it's a way that I can try to help companies that don't have a lot of resources get to the next step. I think you know, um, people people do it differently. Another way to do it is if you are stuck, kind of paying the lawyer. Uh, it's always more efficient if you come in with a list of questions and an agenda. Don't go in to say, hey, we just want to kick around an idea, and three hours later you say, I'm not sure I got anything out of that. But come in with a very specific list of things you want to you want to address. Um, so there's a couple different alternatives. You know, talk to Jim uh, and just, hey, tell, tell him exactly what you just told me and see what his suggestion is. Um, maybe maybe he'll take you out to lunch too, I don't know. <laughs> so it just seems but it, that you do, you're, you have your finger on the pulse of how people take that next step. Right, right, so it, you're right. And it, it, it is a challenge, right? Because a, a lot of the startups use a lot of their resources um, on the product development, which obviously they have to do. You know, hopefully the lawyers are saying, there's a lot of things you need to do, let's prioritize. One of the things we commonly do with our clients who come in uh, is, yeah, there's 15 things that you need to worry about. We're not even gonna talk about the bottom 12. Let's talk about the top three, because you have limited time, resources, energy, money to spend on this stuff, and let's make sure we nail down the most important pieces. Um, and then we do a lot of things too that uh, either, you know, Jim or I can talk to you about where we try to, you know, help our clients tap in, not only to us, but other people that can help. Um, you know, tapping in, I, I don't know what your, your product is or anything, but tap into the New Hampshire High Tech Council might be an example of some of the events they do to help you build up your own network. Um, the Entrepreneurs Forum, it might be an opportunity for you to come and do a presentation um, and try to meet and network with investors. Uh, the business plan competition that I just mentioned. Um, so there's a lot that we try to do as lawyers that are value add, but nothing that we bill for. Um, and it just, you know, I, you know, it just we, we try to do the best we can, I guess, um, to, 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 to be a resource um, with all of the other constraints that are kind of built into that. And so I'm happy to talk to you too after this a little bit, just kind of kick some things around. Um, I just want to add, it, it's not happening here. Um, I mastermind with somebody in St. Louis, and um, they said they were going to do an active One of the things that I've heard recently from this person is that accountants, CFOs, and lawyers are now actually contributing services in return for equity. So yeah. I don't know when that's going to happen here, but that's happening there. Yeah, so that's a, there's a big can of worms that we can open. Um, <laughs> One other thing I wanted to mention, there are in some of those competitions, like the business plan competition I mentioned, if you get in and you win, you win the cash that I mentioned, uh, um, but whoever is sponsoring, accountant, lawyer, whatever, also will be providing uh, free services up to some level. So it's good to just know about a lot of the stuff that's out there that you can tap into, and part of the challenge is just knowing what you should, you know, what you should be trying to tap into and building out your network. Um, in terms of equity for services, 
it is something that you know we, we can do. There's an inherent conflict of interest in doing that. The lawyer's duty, you know, to zealously advocate for the client is at least theoretically compromised if we're also an owner. You know, do you sell the company because it's best for the client, or do you sell the company because it's not really nice to get our bill paid, right? So it's the inherent conflict of interest, and we only do it um, once we've had very lengthy discussions with the client. We don't like to do it out of the gate. We only like to do it along with other investors, so we're not trying to set a value. There's a whole bunch of rules that we follow because that's what we feel comfortable with. Um, and I think, you, in general, putting the lawyers aside for a minute, because we don't need to pick on them anymore. <laughs> uh, but equity for anything, don't, don't think that it's cheap. It's not cash, but it's not cheap, okay, for two reasons. One is if you issue the equity in a way that's not legally correct, uh, it's very expensive, time-consuming, and hard to fix later. And the other thing is, if you provide me equity for services that I provide, and let's say I do $100 worth of work for you and you give me five shares of stock, um, and then down the road that five shares of stock actually becomes worth you know, a million bucks, you've grossly overpaid me for the services I provided. So it's, equity is not cash, but it's not cheap. I think you, get, you gotta look at it that way too with some of the things that are going on. Yeah, on that same idea, that being a startup myself, I can, I can feel those pains in terms of different things. What about, um, you know, kind of the more boutique law firms, for lack of a better word, that are out there that say, look, here, you know, kind of your, you want to incorporate or you want to do this or something like that and say, here's the set fee. We're kind of saying, we, we know there may be some intricacies with that, but then it's not kind of the thing where you get put in a position where you're in there for three hours talking about something, you just kind of said, yeah, now we want to go for a patent. You're like, great, that's three hours plus the patent on top of that. So what's your thoughts, A, on that, and, and uh, B, um, the number of kind of uh, firms that are kind of looking at that for startups because they know their capital is fixed in terms of legal costs? Yeah, I, I think you got to look at the law firm or your accounting firm or whoever is a, a, a business partner. It's got to be somebody you can trust. I mean, any law firm that's working with startups or any company, I mean, startups especially because they have such limited resources, I've got to have a long-term view, right? And that's our view, it's long-term. It's not how much can I build them for to help them set up their company, because that doesn't benefit anybody. But it's really a matter of, you know, sitting down and, and you know, having discussions. How much is this going to cost? Is that an estimate or is it fixed? You know, is there any way, um, and do I really need you to do it? I mean, to just form a company, technically you can go to, I shouldn't tell you this, but you can go to the New Hampshire Secretary of State's website and download all the forms you need to form your own company. You know, technically you don't need a lawyer. There are, there are things that we can do, but we don't bring value. So I think if you're working with your professional advisors, I feel we're getting a little off course here with the uh, equity, non-equity, but as you're dealing with your advisors, ask them where they are, they, they're gonna bring the most value. And what are the things that either you can handle um, or what are the things that you know maybe you can handle in a way that's less expensive? I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when you get to the point where you need personnel policies, for example, you can pay us to come up with an employee handbook, um, but maybe what's more efficient is to have an HR person, a consultant that you know, whose rate is lower, you know, really do it, and then maybe we look at it, maybe we don't, hopefully we do, but it, overall the cost of that might be less. We don't make as much money on that, but that's not what we're in it for. I mean, we're really in it to, at least, my philosophy, our philosophy, is to help the companies grow, so a longer term view. I don't know if that answers your question, but well, it's really trying to figure out what the value prop is. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, so I just want to say, Mike is on a, uh, may have to go before the end, so we have, we have any questions that- uh, Yeah, I'm just going to ask him a couple, actually. Can yeah, you hear me, Mike? Maybe? Mike? You there? Hi. That mic doesn't actually uh, <laughs> oh. go to him. It's this one on the floor. Okay. Maybe I'll just go yeah, kneel in front of this. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mike. Hi. <laughs> um, I had a couple questions for you. Um, one, equity crowdfunding has been legal in some other countries for several years. Um, Great Britain, I think, Australia. Have there been lessons learned in those places um, related to fraud or success stories? Or can you just talk a little bit more about the experiences of maybe other countries and, and some things uh, maybe that have been learned that we can apply to the regulations here in the U.S.? Sure. Um, so it, it's always good to look at analogs um, to learn from experiences in any kind of similar industry. Uh, and we have seen crowdfunding, which has been legal now, or, or at least in practice in, in Australia and Europe for, for a little while now. <clears throat> the type of crowdfunding that has generally been done there is very different from the kind of systems that we're talking about. <clears throat> Most of those portals are 
kind of private equity shops or finance guys that have set up deals to help finance kind of mid-stage funding rounds for companies that already have um, operations um, and have, are generally raising a, a, a lot more money than we're talking about here. So the average investment size per investor is, is much higher uh, than we're talking about, and the, the amount that the company is raising is much higher. And a lot of the due diligence is being done by the principles of the crowdfunding platform itself. So basically, they go out, they source the deal, they look into it, they say, okay, this is good, um, and then they kind of release that deal to, to their kind of community of, of potential investors. So it, it's less of a peer-to-peer -peer network um, or crowdsourcing network than what it is that we're developing. They haven't had any incidences of fraud um, that, that I've heard of, or when we looked into this kind of more, more in depth, about three months ago, there had not been any incidences of fraud. Um, so I mean, that's just kind of more, more support for the argument that fraud is not something we really need to be concerned with here. But it is, it, they, they do have to be qualitatively different than, than the types of platforms I think, that you see uh, popping up in the US. <clears throat> differentiate itself from these other intermediaries and portals? Yeah. So the main way thing that makes us so different um, is this idea of really facilitating the post-transaction relationship. So we, we really believe that startups are going to get at least as much value out of their investors after the fact that after they invest than they are, you know, from just the capital itself, right? So crowdfunding makes sense for any <coughs> consumer-facing company. I, I spoke to a friend of mine or the other day who closed a round led by Mitch Kapoor over a million dollars and it's a consumer facing brand company and he said if I could do this today I would open up another hundred thousand dollar tranche and sell it in kind of you know the smallest increments that I could because basically you're telling me that people are going to pay me to be lifelong brand advocates for my product and help me go through my kind of uh, customer development cycles fast. Um, so that to have that happen effectively you really need a back-end system to facilitate that Communication and interaction and, and tracking of who's doing what and who's being kind of a good investor for the for the startup and that real relationship brokering is where we we specialize now. There's a number of other things that are kind of more basic, like we just have uh, we think is a much better product team than any of our, our competitors. We've obviously been in this from the beginning, getting the, the legislation itself passed, and we're going to be focusing kind of more on, on, on a high level of quality startup rather than um, just kind of doing a stock on blast, letting anyone that wants to come onto the portal uh, post a, a deal. But really, we, we think that the, the huge differentiator is going to be in the, the first piece of the relationship building. Do you have a general demographic for your, the people who signed up to say that they want to be investors? Or is it, does they really span the, the range of people? Uh, they really do span the range. We, we, we try not to, to really kind of spam the, uh, the investors to get too much of their demographic information. Uh, we've been kind of doing different, we, there's an investor certification form on our site where people kind of raise their hand to, to say what their income levels are, and it's, it's pretty high. Uh, so we, I think we see the average cap on our site of unaccredited investors um, is around $7,000. So you're seeing a rel relatively high income level of, of folks that, that are interested in this, right? So that would net out to be something around a hundred and ten. Uh, $20,000 or something like that around there. Mike, I yeah. would assume that a lot of your clients, the companies looking for funding, are going to be pre-commercial stage or are just ready to go into commercialization. Yeah. Now in the old days, that was what a lot of VC companies would do, and they would not only provide the funding, but they would also provide management assistance, riding side saddle and helping the management through that difficult process. Then they started to fade away, so the angel investor came along, and a lot of these were fellows who retired and would put the money up and they became part of the management team. My question is, are you prepared to try to fill that role within your organization directly, or are you going to have some outside linkage because these people are in that category definitely need help. Absolutely. So uh, I think this is one of the reasons why we think that crowdfunding is is so complementary to the kind of traditional investment 
um, structures. There's, there's value that you're going to get from VCs and angels, um, which you might not necessarily get from the crowd. Um, but there's value from the crowd that you're going to get that you're definitely not going to get from angels and, and VCs. Um, as, as a company, we will not be providing direct uh, assistance to any of the businesses that, that raise money to our site. We just don't have the bandwidth or the resources to be able to do that. Um, but again, when I talk about the motivations of the investors that are going to be putting money into these companies, you're going to have several hundred individuals who really care about what you're doing and are going to have their own, own specific way of being able to add value. Um, so this isn't to say that an angel who has done this with 40 different companies over the span of five different years is not going to have some more expertise on um, navigating specific kind of challenges that startups tend to have, and they've, they've seen kind of several several instances of this. Um, but we do think that there is going to be a lot of value that startups will be able to glean from from crowd investors.